Okay, so now I want to show you an example of a simple manifold which you'll hopefully be familiar with. R2, just the plane of all points, if you like, which we know is a topological space with now the standard topology. We saw how to construct this using open balls and such. Now we can consider an atlas. I'll leave that blank for now. So how does this space look? Well, it's simply two real lines. Since we know the elements of this set, it's a Cartesian product, are just points. And now I'm going to call the elements of this first line X, and the other line, I'll label them as Y. So points in the set are these pairs of numbers, x and y. So this is our manifold set. We now want to consider how we would construct a chart for this manifold, this set of points with some topology that's understood. So we know our topology allows us to create really any open set we like around the points. So for simplicity, we can just consider circular balls of open sets because we know we can then build any uh, open set out of a union of these circular ball open sets. And we know that this notion of topology kind of gives a, a notion of a neighbourhood of a point, which we sometimes use, um, which effectively just lets the point know about all of its neighbouring points, and that... Um, yeah, there's no distance structure implied already at, at this point. We simply talk about the relationship between points in open sets. We can scale this as much as we like. But if we introduce a metric in the space, we define a notion of distance. I'm not going to do that now. I'm just going to consider constructing a chart map from this set um, to, well, an open subset of R2. This is a rather simple manifold in that the base manifold that we're using is already uh, R, R to some power. We know that the chart map has to be a map from the manifold into the image of the chart map. So the chart map maps some subset of M into its image, which is a subset of R, in this case R2. So we're mapping into another copy of R2. So the simplest possible map we could do would just to let this map be the identity map. Essentially, we map each point into each point. It seems rather trivial and stupid to do that, but it is a valid now, if you like, coordinatization of this space. So, this is frequently called Cartesian space, or Cartesian coordinates. Okay, so that's a pretty trivial coordinate map of this space. We understand Cartesian coordinates fairly well, but we know just as equally as we can use Cartesian coordinates we can use polar coordinates. So, polar coordinates, you uh, define some, so we're coordinatizing this space, I've drawn it as the square axis, just for um, reference now. We start at the common origin, and then we coordinatize the space by defining some radius from the origin, and then the particular angle between the, if you like, the x-axis, so some angle theta, and some radius r, that tells you the location now of the corresponding point x, y. So the corresponding chart map which we're using is 
that this radius number is the square root of where these x and y's come from our original R2. So that tells us what the number radius is. And then the number theta is just given by... So those two numbers taken together, r and theta, tell you what the point x and y is under this kind of polar coordinate map. So how what polar coordinates actually do is they effectively create these rings in the space. So these are, if you like, rings of constant radius. And then we have all the possible kind of theta values that you could create. These radii now are able to span the entire space, but rather than giving you the xy coordinates, you are given the r theta coordinate. So now we've covered this entire space using these r theta coordinates, if you like. You can reach any xy by just specifying a radius and a theta. So if you like, we can reinter we can redraw this as a map into r2 in the following way. If now I call this axis the radius and this axis theta, so we kind of um, are just going to sort of gloss over the fact that theta is now bounded to be between 0 and 2 pi. That's okay. That just takes us all the way around. So we could consider if I draw a line in this space now, I pick some radius along here, and then I consider varying theta all the way from 0 up to 2 pi. This line which I've drawn in our chart map, so this is the map from R2, the base manifold, so this would be, say, now phi polar. This maps the manifold into the another copy of R2, but rather than being x and y coordinates, it's the theta and r coordinate. So this image in the chart map, how does it look in the real space? Well, we've picked some radius, so we're at a radius, and then we vary theta continuously, so it just takes us in a loop all the way around. And then similarly we could start at some theta value and then continuously vary the radius and we would just travel along one of these radial paths depending on where the theta value we started at. So this is a kind of simple example that illustrates how the base manifold R2 we kind of, since it's uh, already R2, we're just mapping into another subset of R2, but the particular numbers we choose to represent the original points are different depending on the chart map. If we had a point here, xy, well, the number xy just defines where the point lives in real space, but it's in general going to be a different number to the r and theta value that we've used to represent that same point, in that we've defined it in this particular way. So the key point to realise now is that both of these sets of coordinates are equally valid descriptions of our original manifold. We're simply just using a different set of numbers to represent the abstract points. In our case it turned out to be simple because we already had the original set of points, we can just use that as one description but it's equally valid to consider this set of numbers as being representative of the points of this manifold. So we should be able to go freely between these two descriptions of our manifold. If I have a point in one coordinate system, I should be able to easily tell you its value in another coordinate system. 
So these are the equations which define the r and theta coordinate system, if you like. We can go between the r and theta coordinates to the x and y coordinates by using the following equations. x is r cosine theta and y is r sine theta. So this is what's known as a transition function or a transition map which effectively takes you between the set of coordinates from one chart map so this would be one chart map into the r theta chart the transition func function takes you into the other chart map so this would be u x y and then this over here might be u r theta so this is a concrete example where we can easily write down an algebraic expression for the transition function. Now I just want to go a bit more general and discuss a general transition function.